We're going to start, I think. Those of you who can just come in if you want to take a seat. That'd be great. So welcome, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Eileen Galuli, and I'm the executive director of the Human Center for the Humanities and a member of the Trilling Seminars Committee. And it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. But before I do, let me say a few words about the Trilling Seminars themselves under the auspices of which Professor Alter's talk tonight is being sponsored. As many of you know, Lionel Trilling was one of Columbia's most celebrated faculty members and among the great humanist scholars and public intellectuals of the 20th century. Shortly after his death in 1975, the Trilling Seminar Series was founded in his memory as a means of perpetuating the kind of speculative inquiry that had engaged Trilling himself throughout his career, providing an intellectual context in which serious questions of major contemporary importance might be discussed before a public and diverse audience. According to the original Trilling Seminars Committee, quote, we look for scholars whose breadth and originality of mind can help the public understand what studies in the humanities can contribute to a clarification of the issues and value assumptions that underlie contemporary life. The committee seeks to identify scholars who are known both for original contributions to their own disciplines and for having addressed questions of major contemporary importance to both scholars and the educated public. Robert Alter is surely the sort of scholar that the original Trilling Seminars Committee had in mind, and including proleptically, I think, Lionel Trilling himself, who taught Bob Alter when he was an undergraduate here at Columbia. Professor Alter is the class of 1937 Professor of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at the University of California, Berkeley, where he has taught since 1967. He's the author of some 23 books, including most recently masterful translations of several books of the Bible. His art of biblical narrative, liter liter narrative literature and his literary guide to the Bible, the latter written with Frank Kermode, who was himself a trilling uh, lecturer in 1981, are essential reading for all of us who have ever taught literature humanities here at Columbia, a course currently taught by more than 60 teachers to more than 1,250 students each year. Professor Alter's honors are too extensive for me to enumerate here, though many of them are noted in the program, though not all. Um, so I'll just single out a few. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the Council of Scholars of the Library of Congress. He's twice been a Guggenheim Fellow and has been awarded fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Institute for Advanced Studies in Jerusalem. In 2009, he received the Robert Kirsch Award from the Los Angeles Times for a lifetime contribution to American letters. Um, tonight, two eminent scholars in their own right, who I'll introduce very briefly, will respond to Professor Alter's talk. I, do you have an order you're going in? Have you figured that one? <laughs> Okay, so Herbert, I'll go alphabetically then. Herbert Marx is professor of comparative literature at Indiana University, where he also directs the Institute for Biblical and Literary Studies and ed edits the monograph series, Indiana Studies in Biblical Literature. He's the editor of the Norton Critical Edition of the English Bible, King James Version, the Old Testament. Michael Wood is Charles Barnwell Strout Professor of 1923, Professor of English and Comparative Literature Emeritus at Princeton University, and the author of books on Nabokov, Buñuel, Kafka, Garcia Marquez, and Hitchcock, among others. A member of the American Philosophical Society and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he's a regular contributor to the London Review of Books and the New York Review of Books. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, as you heard, I, I was Lionel Trilling's student, so this is uh, especially meaningful to me. I was a, an English major many years ago in, at Columbia College, and I, I took his senior seminar, which was one semester um, Romantics and one semester Victorian. And actually, uh, Lionel Trilling helped launch my career because while I, I was his senior, he sent me to meet his uh, former student, Norman Podhoritz, who was then a young editor 
at Commentary, and Commentary probably you, you know was then a very different magazine from what it later became. And um, uh, Norman Vatoris was very encouraging. He said, well, stay in touch with me. He subsequently left Commentary and came back three or four years later as editor-in-chief, at which point I took him up on his invitation and um, wrote him a letter and invited me to do a piece for the magazine on uh, the, the, uh, the Hebrew novelist S.Y. Agnon. Uh, I was in graduate school at the time, and, and that's how I started publishing. I, I also have to say, this is my last preliminary remark, that, that uh, I, I think that tonight's topic would have been uh, of a special interest to, to Lionel Trilling. First, uh, as uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, um, he was deeply engaged in questions of politics and the novel. And in his teaching career at Columbia, this is a course I did not take, he and Jacques Barzan regularly taught uh, a, a colloquium uh, in which uh, I think every year the Charter House of Parma figured. Okay. I would like to begin with a brief autobiographical anecdote. In the late 1970s, through circumstances not entirely of my devising, I found myself working on two large projects separated from each other by nearly 3,000 years, a critical biography of Stendhal and a book on biblical narrative. From time to time, I would ask myself whether I might be a little daft to be doing this, wondering whether there could be any conceivable connection between the two subjects. On the biblical side, because the David story is one of the greatest pieces of extended narrative in the Hebrew Bible, I drew many examples from it for my book. With the passage of time, it dawned on me that because the David story and Stendhal's charter house of Parma are two of the supremely knowing narratives about politics and our literary tradition, there might be connections between them for all the obvious differences. Let me first note the most salient of these differences. The David story is told by a narrator who, like his counterparts elsewhere in the Bible, makes a point of keeping a very low profile, not commenting on the characters and events, allowing actions and dialogue to speak for themselves. Stendhal's narrator, by contrast, offers a good deal of commentary on the characters and often seems virtually to chat with the reader, a procedure Stendhal may have picked up from Fielding, whom he passionately admired. He says somewhere that he'd like to, to write this novel like Tom Jones, only Tom Jones written in the 1830s instead of uh, the, the 1740s. Um, so he sets almost everything in a, a worldly, ironic perspective. The, sat the satiric outlook of Charterhouse generates moments of high comedy, a quality entirely absent from the urgently intense biblical story. In addition to these differences, Stendhal's novel of 1838 is even more strongly attached to European romanticism than it is to the scintillating acerbic prose of 18th century England and France that it emulates. The rapturous lyric evocations of landscapes are of course inconceivable in the Bible. And though the book swarms with political intrigues, at its center is a tale of extravagant romantic love. The novel in fact has no less than four extravagant lovers, Fabrice, Clelia, whose love for him proves to be as measureless as his for her, Gina, Fabrice's aunt, whose unswerving devotion to him barely conceals its incipiently incestuous, uh, an incipiently incestuous passion, and Count Mosca, who loves Gina beyond all the prudential considerations of his, uh, uh, that he has as a consummate courtier. The one instance of headlong love in the biblical story is I'm going to pronounce it uh, in the Hebrew way so as not to confuse it with, with Michael's first name, Michal's <laughs> uh, love for David. Um, she is the only woman in uh, all of 
biblical narrative of whom it is explicitly said that she loves a man. Piquantly, she anticipates Clelia in risking her father's dangerous wrath by enabling her beloved to escape from assassins. Well, I don't think there's any uh, influence there. But this is scarcely a romantic story of love unto death. And in the end, we see her after David has long been separated from her and taken other wives, seething with resentment against him. Other joinings of man and woman in this story seem either cases of self-interest or lust rather than love. A word is in order about the status of each of these narratives as fiction. The court of Parma and all that transpires within it are, of course, patently fictitious, in this instance being Stendhal's novelistic expansion of a 16th century Italian story he had come across. There are skeptics among biblical scholars who contend that everything in the David story is equally fictional invention, though that seems to me unlikely. I would propose that the writer who might conceivably have lived only a few decades after David, although I don't know that for sure, had before him an account written or oral of the principal events of David's reign, but that in order to make compelling sense of them, he felt free to elaborate and to improvise and to employ techniques that are characteristic of fiction, such as interior monologues, brief though they, are, they may be, dialogue where no one beside the two historical personages is present, pointed literary allusion, and the thematic shaping of the narrative through recurring motifs and episodes that mirror each other. Uh, this is, in other words, what we would call historical fiction as well as political fiction. As in Shakespeare's history plays, the writer cannot allow himself to invent significant historical events that never happen. But he does imagine the historical figures as characters, and perhaps may introduce some that are chiefly or even wholly his own invention. The question then that I'd like to propose is what insights into the workings of politics might the medium of fiction make available. A suspicious person could claim that the two really have nothing to do with each other. Uh, no more, say, than demographic surveys and depth psychology. Stendhal's narrator, in, in a, a famous aside late in the novel, seems to express something like this view, though with a qualifying uh, twist that is worth pondering. I quote, and all the quotations uh, from Stendhal and the Bible are my translations. The, the Bible translation is out in print for quite a few years. Um, so th this is uh, what the narrator says in, in Charterhouse. Politics in a work, work of literature is a pistol shot in the middle of a concert, something crude, but to which nevertheless it is impossible to refuse one's attention. My guess is that Stendhal's implicit fantasy of an unalloyed work of literature would be a perfect chain of such moments as for beasts looking out with rapture over the Italian landscape from his prison perch in the Farnese Tower, or Clelia telling him in grand operatic fashion as they come together in the dark at last to consummate their love. Entre ici, ami de mon coeur, enter here, my heart's beloved. Uh, in a literary work uh, so conceived, politics is indeed a, a, a violent disruption. But as the qualifying last clause that I've just, of the, what I've just quoted intimates, Politics, however much, much we might dream of escaping it, is the context in which we live, the force that determines much of our collective and individual lives, crude, grossier, though it may be. An adequate representation of human destinies in society 
cannot easily exclude it. And when it makes its presence felt in a work of fiction, it compels our attention through the force of its decisive importance. The special purchase that fiction has on politics, I think, is through character. Political events are not the purely mechanical consequence of historical forces, whether economic, social, or institutional, but are shaped, even driven, by the individual players in the political arena. It is individual character that writers of fiction at their best subtly understand, and good political fiction serves as a medium in which revelatory hypotheses about the relation between character and power can be played out. One may safely set aside the once fashionable notion, at least I would, that <laughs> the, the individual is the invention of the Renaissance or of Protestant introspection or of capitalism. Only a bad reader of ancient literature, of Homer as well as of the Bible, could come to that conclusion. In the proto-novelistic narrative of the Book of Samuel, the distinctive character of David and Saul and Samuel is altogether striking and dictates much of what happens in the political realm. Let me propose a few underlying perceptions about the nature of life in politics that are shared by Stendhal and the author of the David story, and then trace the workings of these perceptions in uh, the two narratives. Politics requires dissembling. One can rarely afford to seem what one really is. A measure of ruthlessness, sometimes murderous ruthlessness, is often necessary for attaining or hanging on to power. The possession of power generally corrupts, according to the old adage, and when it does not actually corrupt, it may nevertheless compromise or discomfit its possessor. Power itself is ambiguous and subject to unanticipated reversals. The character traits of the political agent are often determinative as to how he or she will fare in the momentous clashes of the political arena. Okay, now I'm gonna go through these uh, uh, general principles one by one. So I'll begin with dissembling. This is a very old story in politics and every four years Americans are obliged to witness a crude public carnival of dissembling in their national elections. Uh, I'll say no more about that. <laughs> uh, it is an idea subtly articulated by Machiavelli and in our narratives, both David and Count Mosca clearly qualify as Machiavellian princes. When Fabrice returns from the imprudent, his imprudent and farcical volunteering in the Napoleonic army at the moment of its final defeat, instructions from his early mentor, the, the Canon Borda, prescribe the regimen he must follow in order to avert any suspicion of political unreliability. He must avoid, this is, I'm summarizing, he must avoid contact with anyone pretending to exercise wit. He must speak with horror of rebellion, read only conservative newspapers, and no books published after 1720, with the possible exception of the novels of Walter Scott. Uh, I love that, a little, little touch. Uh, and court a local beauty belonging to the aristocracy. A little later, Count Mosca advises him in a similar vein. Now I quote, if a brilliant line of reasoning, a triumphant rejoinder occurs to you that could change the direction of a conversation, do not yield to the temptation to display your brilliance. Keep quiet. It will be time enough to be witty when you are a bishop. Uh, do we still have b witty bishops? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All this, one can say, is political dissembling is comedy, though, as is often the case in Charter House, the consequences of the comic byplay may be deadly. The frequently beguiling interactions between Mosca and the Prince of Parma, and more strikingly between Gina and the Prince of 
uh, and the prince are necessarily calculated play acting. And at one point, it is said of the splendid, brilliantly improvising duchess that she altogether relishes playing such a role on the royal stage. An exemplary instance of David dissembling, or at the very least adopting protective camouflage, occurs when he becomes an adulated miracle military hero, and we are told, quote, that all Israel and Judah loved David. It is noteworthy that David is repeatedly the object, never the subject, of the verb to love. He resembles Fabrice in being a beautiful young man who repeatedly attracts the solicitous attention of women. But whereas Fabrice is an innocent, and in some respects continues to be that, David, as far as we can tell, is never an innocent. Seeing David's appeal to the people, Saul is consumed with jealousy and hatches a scheme to do away with him. And now I quote, and Saul said to David, here is my oldest daughter, Merav. Her shall I give to you as wife, only be a valiant fellow for me and fight the battles of the Lord. And Saul had thought, let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. And David said to Saul, who am I and who are my kin, my father's clan in Israel, that I should be the king's son-in-law? A second sound, a round of exchange, this exchange occurs. It turns out that Merav has been promised to another man. And so Saul proposes his daughter Michal instead. The king sends his courtiers with this message to David, who carefully maintains the same posture. And again, I'm quoting, is it a light thing in your eyes to become son-in-law to the king? And I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. And Saul's servants told him, saying, words of this sort David has spoken. And Saul said, thus shall you say to David, the king has no desire for any bride price except a hundred Philistine foreskins to take vengeance against the king's enemies. And Saul had devised to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. The pointed contrast, all, all this is 1 Samuel 18, if you want to check it out at home afterwards. Uh, this pointed contrast uh, throughout this passage is between a bumbling king and an astute contender for the throne, who has, of course, been clandestinely anointed by the prophet Samuel. Saul's intentions are entirely transparent. As one sees in the deployment of interior monologue, let not my hand be against him, but the hand of the Philistines. And in the narrator spelling out his scheme, for Saul had devised to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. The scheme itself is equally transparent for the courtiers enlisted as go-betweens would surely have realized that a plan for David to bring back the foreskins of a hundred slain Philistine warriors was intended to be his death sentence. Later, David, having lost his political edge, this is a fascinating turn in the story, after his adultery with Bathsheba, will uh, commit the very same blunder by plotting to have Uriah killed by having him put in an exposed place under the walls of the be besieged city Rabat Amon, where the enemy will cut him down. But what do we learn about David in this encounter? There is no interior monologue for him, no narrator's analysis of his motives, only public speech. This is a pattern that will be repeated throughout the first half of the David story. That speech has roughly the same revelatory value as Fabrice's ostentatious reading of conservative newspapers. Perhaps he actually feels unworthy of the hand of the king's daughter, though the profession of poverty and low esteem is surely excessive, for from what we can tell, his father is a prosperous pastoralist. Perhaps such declarations are a matter of court etiquette. 
What seems most likely, however, is that David declares he is scarcely fit to marry into the royal family because that is just what he wants to do in order to buttress his eventual claim to the throne and just what he does not want Saul to suspect. One attains eminence by seeming not to seek it. In the end, it is the artfully opaque David, not the all too transparent Saul, who will possess the throne and found a dynasty. And uh, I, I love this passage because it, it shows how carefully the, the writer chooses narrative means to, to make his point. That a Saul with explanations by the narrator of his motives, with interior monologue, David, no explanations, no interior monologue, only his public speech. Okay, our next topic is ruthlessness. The acquisition and preservation of power are not for the faint of heart. And a person who betrays you in the political give and take may have to be eliminated. In the words of the adage Mosca quotes to Fabrice, it's better to kill the devil than to let the devil kill you. Though this is an assumption that casts a dark shadow over the events of both these narratives, there is what I call a quantitative difference between the two. The David story is strewn with corpses. The whole story is like the last act, uh, 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 the last scene of Hamlet. In Charter House, a few executions have been carried out prior to the events of the novel. One killing occurs that is not a political act. There is a regicide. And of course, we are aware of the hovering threat to Fabrice's life whether by poison or by execution. This smaller body count accords with the notion that Mosca and even more emphatically Gina cultivate of politics as an enlivening game, a notion that would have, uh, they would have difficulty preserving with their blood everywhere in the court of Parma. It is a game for Gina in particular in her role as the brilliant and seductive Duchess of San Severina that enables her to cling to a sense of youth, which she often fears, sometimes quite comically, is slipping away from her. You know, looking in the, in the mirror at the age of 28, she thinks she's an old hag. Uh, nevertheless, we are repeatedly reminded that the stakes of the game are deadly. Political actions like those in other spheres are frequently overdetermined, and thus it is instructive that each of our narratives features an act of vengeance that may also serve a political end. When uh, Prince Ranus Ernest IV violates the written pledge he has made to free Fabrice from prison, exploiting the absence of the one binding sentence in the agreement he signs that Mosca, out of a courteous reflex, has decided to delete, Gina determines to make him pay for his treachery. She is, one should note, the exact opposite of a Machiavellian, acting on impulse, often unpredictable even to herself, as the narrator tells us. Gina proceeds then to enlist the poet and revolutionary Ferrante to poison the prince, and the murder is never traced back to her. It is an act that satisfies her sense of outrage in having been betrayed in the matter closest to her heart, but it is also politi a politically useful death. The prince, after making sure that Fabrice remains in his cell in the Farnese Tower, might readily take steps to have him killed. And in regard to the exercise of power within the court, Gina has been thwarted by the prince, put at his mercy just when she appeared to have the upper hand. So it serves her interest as well as her vengeance to eliminate the, the ruler. This aspect of the regicide is highlighted in the passage we'll look at toward the end of my presentation. The anal analogous murder in the David story is Joab's assassination of Abner, the military commander of the forces loyal to the house of Saul, who has come to broker a peace agreement with David 
after a protracted civil war between the northern and southern tribes. Joab is furious with David when he learns the king has parlayed with Abner. And setting out after him, he lures him to the roadside and stabs him to death. The motive spelled out by the narrator is vendetta. Abner had killed Joab's brother Asael in battle. And so Joab now exacts vengeance in the stark Hebrew idiom, redemption uh, or redeeming the blood of his brother. But Joab surely has a political motive as well. After all, Abner is his counterpart as field commander. And with the 12 tribes now to be united under David, the king could well decide to replace him with Abner. Much later in the story, Job carries out another assassination precisely on these grounds with no consideration of vendetta involved. David evidently angered over um, Joab's killing of Absalom, appoints Amasa to replace him as commander of the troops, and Joab regains his position by murdering his rival, again in a roadside stabbing. One of the fascinating aspects of the David story is that Joab, who was actually his nephew, presumably David's sister Tsuya must be a, a lot older than David, uh, uh, Joab serves as an implacable political alter ego for David, exercising a ruthlessness that is or comes to be beyond David. It remains murkily ambiguous whether David might be complicit in at least some of Joab's murderous acts. Upon the death of Abner, David takes extravagant steps to dissociate himself from the killing and to profess helplessness before Joab and the, his equally fierce brother Abishai. I am gentle, he says. The Hebrew adjective rach could also mean simply soft. And just anointed king and these sons of Tsuya, that is Joab and his brother, are too hard for me. It does not seem, in fact, that Abner's death would be in David's political interest, though we may at least wonder whether he could have some indirect role in the progressive elimination of scions of the House of Saul. In any case, there is a dramatic clash between David and Joab over the killing of Absalom. Despite Absalom's usurping of the throne and his deadly intentions toward his father, David has enjoined the troops as they go out to battle, deal gently with the lad Absalom. Joab is too unblinking a political pragmatist to allow Absalom to survive. Uh, he no doubt perceives him as the devil you must kill before he kills you. And Joab makes sure to finish him off when he finds him caught by his hair in the oak. David is memorably devastated by the news of his son's death, at this point ceasing to be a political animal and overwhelmed by his instincts as father. Joab, returning from the battlefield, roundly rebukes him with a threat ordering him to put aside his grief and go out to speak words of encouragement to the troops who seem about to disperse. And these are Joab's words to David. For by the Lord I have sworn, if you go not out, that not a man shall spend the night with you, and this will be a greater evil for you than any evil that has befallen you from your youth until now. The two men have undergone decades of hardship and dangers together on the battlefield and in the court. But now the relation of power between them is painfully reversed. Next topic, the uneasiness of power. Ranus Ernst, Ernst IV is a virtually absolute monarch with no evident constitutional constraints and a weak political opposition held to be subversive and persisting more or less underground. But uh, his exercise of absolute authority is unsettlingly troubled by two doubts. Is the authority, in practical terms, absolute, or are there people in the kingdom, such as the Duchess of San Severina, <laughs> 
who might undermine that authority. And given Parma's standing as a puny state, how does the power of the prince measure up to that of monarchs in grander realms? Stendhal translates these insecurities into lively satiric comedy. The prince has a large portrait of Louis XIV hanging in his chambers and habitually tries to strike the pose, the facial expression, the regal manner of the roi soleil. The discerning eye of the Duchess of San Severina takes all this in and is alert to its ridiculous aspect. I quote, the Duchess found that at certain moments the imitation of Louis XIV was a bit too pronounced. For example, in his manner of smiling benignly while all the while tossing back his head. The prince has all the political power, but the duchess has the greater power of confident poise and subtle intelligence. Uh, she's really one of the great women characters of the 19th century novel. Uh, this contrast is played out in the brilliant scene that begins part two of the novel, when Gina, whom the prince expects to see, dissolves in tears, imploring him to save Fabrice, arrives at the palace buoyant and radiant in her travel clothes, announcing that she's about to leave his kingdom forever. The potentate of Parma is reduced to a repeated splutter. Comment, comment, what, what? and is altogether nonplussed by the Duchess, but also compelled to admire her and to tell himself what a grand thing it would be to make her his mistress. Much, of the, same, much the same confrontation with a somewhat related reversal of positions of power as enacted in Gina's last encounter with Renus Ernest the Fourth son who uh, assumes the throne after his father's assassination. The young prince uh, has promised Gina that he will free Fabrice in prison a second time and again in danger of being poisoned if she will make a solemn vow to yield to him once Fabrice's safety is assured. When she arrives at the palace, once again in traveling clothes, uh, she knows that had a great traveling uh, wardrobe. Uh, the prince uh, first pronounces, proposes, I'm sorry, that she enjoy all the privileges of becoming his royal consort and ends by compelling her to fulfill her vow. People have told him that once a woman submits to you, she will be forever bound to you as your mistress. He's a very young man, by the way, for those who don't remember the details of the novel. In one of the most uh, amusing elisions of a sexual act in the 19th century novel, he makes his final demand at three minutes before 10 in the evening and, I quote, at 10.30, the Duchess climbed into her carriage and left for Bologna. If we allow time for the two to make their way <laughs> to the royal bedchamber and for Gina to divest herself of, of whatever of her no doubt layered garments is strictly necessary in order to perform the act and then to put them on again, the prince's longed for consummation will have taken no more than a few minutes. And having exerted his power over Gina, he is left defeated in his conquest and powerless, powerless to prevent her from leaving Parma forever. The signal reversal of power in the David story also turns on a sexual act. David, having risen to the throne largely through military prowess and having endured many perils during his time in the Badlands, has conquered Jerusalem and made it the seat of his monarchy. At this point, he becomes a sedentary ruler in the strictly etymological sense of the term. And it happened, I quote from the beginning of the Bathsheba story, at the turn of the year, at the time the kings sally forth, that David sent out Joab and his servants and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. Uh, 
and David was sitting in Jerusalem. And that, that verb, it can also mean stay, but it is the primary verb, lashevet, uh, to, to sit in Hebrew, hence the sedentary Marnik thing. Uh, first he is sitting, then lying down for a siesta, then awakening, perhaps even in an after-sleep condition of physical arousal, and before long, lying in the sexual sense. Men in power, ancient and modern, need agents to carry out their designs, something like a governmental bureaucracy, which David, ensconced in his new capital city, appears to have. The paired terms send, lishloach, and messenger, malach, appear again and again in this pivotal story. The to and froing of all the messengers makes it virtually impossible for David to keep secret the act he urgently wants to conceal or to have his orders implemented precisely as he has dictated. Everything in his long trajectory as commander and then king begins to unravel in this episode. He will immediately be castigated, in fact, really cursed by Nathan the prophet, and his royal house will be torn apart, the trigger to the chain of disasters being another sexual transgression, the rape of his daughter Tamar by her half-brother Amnon. It is worth pondering the question of power in the relationship between Bathsheba and David. At first glance, it seems that she's purely passive, he sees her bathing, summons her to his bed, and she unquestionably submits. Unqu I'm sorry, unquestioningly submits. The only word, words ascribed to her in the entire story are, I am pregnant. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's only two words. Here, there is no possibility of the exercise of personal magnetism, as in Gina's case. David sees a beautiful naked body from a distance, wants to enjoy it, and gives the command so that he can consummate his desire. But we do not know whether Bathsheba complies simply because the king's command can brook no resistance. She does, after all, emerge from this dubious affair as one of David's wives. She then disappears from the narrative until many years later when an aged, enfeebled David is lying on what will soon be his deathbed. At that point, however, she shows remarkable astuteness in manipulating the evidently befuddled king to assure the succession of her son Solomon to the throne. And after David's death, she subtly contrives matters so that Solomon feels impelled to execute his rival Adonijah. Perhaps, this shrewdness is a quality she has acquired during her years in the court. But it leads one to wonder whether her initial response to David's lust might, have, might not have been uh, of passivity, but for, of, from calculation. Whether the seemingly powerless soldier's wife might have understood that sexual submission to the king could lean to gaining access to power in the court. And the whole affair, as I've noted, inaugurates the decline of David's power. The common denominator between these two stories is the overconfidence of power. If troops march and heads fall and courtiers bow and scrape at your bidding, you may slip into the illusion that you can always act with impunity. Even in the democratic United States, there have been many egregious instances of men in positions of power who have behaved precisely in this manner. David imagines that he can simply have the wife of one of his loyal fighting men at his beck and call. The result is a botched effort at a cover-up his murder of the husband, and many others, uh, um, many others perish with Uriah through Joab's pragmatic revising of David's instructions and a chain of disasters in the royal house. The Prince of Parma thinks he can coolly renege on the pledge to free Fabrice, 
quite failing to recognize that the Duchess of San Severina can be as implacable as she is charming, and the consequence is his death. Both these writers understand that even purportedly absolute power is not entirely absolute, and that a ruler may overstep his mandate and find himself confronted by an adversary he has not anticipated uh, or entangled in moral and social snares uh, he had not reckoned with. Uh, the masculine pronoun, by the way, I is appropriate here, not only because the monarchs in both the narratives are men, but also because they exhibit a certain overweening male confidence, which makes them especially vulnerable to the shrewdness of women. So you see, that's, that's not just a modern <laughs> idea. <laughs> the, am the ambiguity of power. The novelistic imagination, that's my next topic. The novelistic imagination manifested in both these stories enables us to see that power, however much it is a goal aspired to, exacts a price from its possessor and is also prone to slippage. One principal effect of power is that it isolates the person who has attained it. David, before he is king, is the leader of a band of fighting men. Uh, its core recruited as a kind of uh, family militia from his hometown in Bethlehem. And he no doubt enjoys a degree of camaraderie with them. He is also surrounded by admiring young women who celebrate his feats in song and dance. And he has an intimate friendship with Jonathan, though in keeping with David's calculating political posture, the indications are that all the expressions of spontaneous affection come from Jonathan's side. Once he settles in as king in Jerusalem, David seems alone indeed. He's alone on his couch when he sees Bathsheba bathing, while his old companions at arms are out in the field. And no intimates or counselors surround him, only courtiers ready to do his bidding. Stendhal's narrator, reporting his character's thoughts in free and direct style, reminds us that the Prince of Parma too is, a, is very much alone. On a certain cold and rainy Thursday, he hears the rattle of carriages on their way to the soiree of the Duchess of San Severina. And now I quote from Stendhal, he felt an impulse of impatience. Others enjoy themselves and he, the sovereign prince, the absolute master who should enjoy himself more than anyone in the world knows only boredom. Not long after, he confides this predicament to Mosca. And these are his words. Yes, my dear friend, let us agree. The pleasures and care of the happiest ambition, even of power without limit, are nothing in comparison with the intimate happiness that is granted by a relationship of tenderness and love. I am a man before I am a prince, and when I have the good fortune to love, to love my mistress, uh, I'm sorry, when I have the good fortune to love, my mistress turns to the man and not to the prince. These words have a special emotional edge because the prince is addressing the person whose mistress is the Duchess of San Severina, the very woman he desires. The split between the man and the prince makes itself felt in the David story in a different way. As I've observed, through the first half of the story, we are denied any knowledge of David the man as against David the military hero and political agent. All this changes upon the death of the baby boy to whom Bathsheba gives birth. David's words to his courtiers, the very first speech that could have no possible political motive, are a wrenching recognition of his own mortality. This is after he figures out the child has died. And now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I am going to him, and he will not come back to me. Much of the subsequent narrative 
will turn on David as father rather than on David as king and on the conflict between the two roles. That is precisely the issue in the clash with Joab after Absalom's death. Joab demands the, he's, he act as king and commander for whom the elimination of Absalom was an urgent political necessity. David, racked by the loss of his son, even a son from whom he had been estranged and who usurped his throne, cannot set aside his paternal feelings, cannot see himself in relation to Absalom except as a father, just as the Prince of Parma imagines that a mistress must turn to him as a man, not a prince. The difference between the two, of course, is that the conflict within David is dead serious making him a tragic hero, and it follows him till his last days, whereas the prince's option of being a man rather than a prince is fleeting. Uh, notion, the prince's notion of being a man rather than a prince is fleeting, and he remains an essentially satiric character. Next topic. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, just a bit more on this. Power both these writers see, takes a toll in the inner life of its wielder. At the same time, as I noted earlier in a different connection, power is inherent, inherently unstable and may slip away for one reason or another. In the case of David, the slippage occurs because in the hardball game of politics, he yields to the imperatives of his private self. At the very end of his story, he is helpless before the machinations of Nathan and Bathsheba be, uh, because of the painful decline of his body and mind in old age, a representation of the sad end of a life that is unique in ancient literature. In the case of the two princes of Parma, the slippage occurs because they make the mistake of provoking a woman who has the inner resources to outmaneuver them. It is deeply instructive in this regard that Stendhal conveys Gina's state of mind after she is determined to have the prince murdered precisely as a reversal of positions of power. And I quote, from that moment, a kind of gaiety reemerged in the character of the Duchess. Before the fatal resolution, in each turn her mind took, in each new thing she saw, she had a sense of her inferiority in relation to the prince, of her weakness and her gullibility. The prince, in her view, had cravenly cheated her. And Count Mosca, by virtue of his courtier's impulse, however innocently, had seconded the prince. From the moment vengeance was resolved, she felt her power. Each turn of her mind made her happy. One of the most rewarding achievements of these two consummate practitioners of political fiction is their ability to imagine the political realm not as a fixed hierarchical structure, but as a system in which institutional constraints are sometimes loosened by the pressures of individual personality with vested power on occasion exhibiting a surprising fluidity. And now I get on to uh, personal character, politics and character. There is some room for dispute about the connection between these two terms. One great novelist, Tolstoy, famously argued in War and Peace that the determination of historical events by powerful leaders, whether generals or emperors, was illusory. But this remains, I think, a minority opinion among novelists, given the bias of the very genre in which they work toward representing the distinctive uh, force of individual character. And even a cursory glance at the political actions of our own day, of, say, uh, George W. Bush, Vladimir Putin, Benjamin Netanyahu lead one, leads one to conclude that the propensities and limitations and personal quirks of national leaders often have far-reaching consequences. The study in contrast between David and Saul is especially instructive in this regard. 
It also argues against the view maintained by many biblical scholars on, on what I think are shaky philological grounds since the 1920s, that the so-called rise of David is an independent narrative essentially separable from what follows. Saul, though initially chosen by the prophet Samuel, perhaps chiefly because he is head and shoulders taller than all the people, it's been observed that, that CEOs are often very tall men, uh, <laughs> appears progressively unfit for kingship. From the very beginning of his na narrative, he is seen as someone seeking knowledge that he is incapable of attaining on his own. In the first episode of his story, he's looking for his father's asses and despairing of finding them, is prepared to go home. He needs his servant's guidance to learn that there's a man of God in the vicinity who can help him. And again, he needs his servant's offer of a quarter shekel of silver so that he can have something to pay the prophet for his divinatory services. This pattern of seeking information or guidance out of ignorance will be reiterated several times in Saul's story. On the last day of his life, before the fatal battle with the Philistines on Mount Gilboa, Saul is desperate to find out what awaits him on the morrow. He consults an oracle, prophets, dream interpreters, divinatory devices, but gets nowhere. Finally, he turns to a necromancer, and she really should not be called a witch, as the old translations do, a practitioner of the very occult art he himself has made a capital crime. The dire knowledge he finally attains from the ghost of Saul is a death sentence for him and his sons. And Sam, uh, from, um, uh, um, uh, from the ghost of Samuel, I misspoke. Samuel is not a cheery character, e even when he's alive, how much more so when he's dead. So his words to um, uh, the inquiring Saul are tomorrow, you and your sons are with me. I, I suspect some connection between the, this story and Macbeth, uh, although the structure is very different. David, on the other hand, keeps close counsel, but appears to have a savvy sense of what's going on around him and what he needs to do in order to attain the, his political ends and when his life is threatened to preserve it. In the latter connection, he even has a mole in Saul's court in the person of Jonathan, as he will have a clever mole in Absalom's court in Hushi. A kind of theurgic manifestation of his access to knowledge is his possession when he and his followers are in flight from Saul of the Urim and Tumim, the divinatory apparatus that conveys to him direct guidance from God as to what course he should follow. He is in some a man who has the Mosca-like penetration to reach the keys of power. But like much else in the story, all this changes after the pivotal Bathsheba uh, episode. When the woman from Tekoa sent by Joab to persuade David to countenance the, re the return of the fugitive um, Absalom to Jerusalem, that proves to be a bad miscalculation, says to him, and my Lord is wise as with the wisdom of a messenger of God to know everything in the land. We are aware, and probably she is too, that virtually the opposite is now true. Penetrating wisdom may be necessary to acquire power, but it's not guaranteed for a lifetime. And one of the remarkable aspects of the David story is that it shrewdly follows the changes in his character over a long life. At the very end, he has become altogether unwitting, reduced to an object of manipulation by Nathan and Bathsheba. It is equally evident in Charterhouse that political events are determined by the distinctive character of the individual players in the game. The self-defeating acts of both princes of Parma flow from their narcissism and their insecurities, compounded in the younger prince by callowness and inexperience. 
Masca is, in effect, the supreme power in the kingdom by virtue of his subtle worldly intelligence, his ability to calculate the suitable means to attain any given end, except for the lapse in deleting the crucial sentence from uh, the first prince, prince's pledge to the duchess. And it is a brilliant move on Stendhal's part that he pairs his Machiavellian minister with a woman who, as I've said, is the very opposite, someone who gets what she wants, not through calculation, but through her natural gift for improvisation and the fierce resolve of her character. As the narrator observes, when she, determine, when she determines to avenge herself of the prince, there are two elements in the character of the duchess. What she had wanted once, she wanted always. She never reconsidered that which she had decided. The very end of the novel is notoriously huddled. Stendhal, perhaps exhausted by his 52 days of breakneck dictation, in a few swift sentences kills off the child born to Fabrice and Clelia, then Clelia, then Fabrice, then Gina. Uh, according to the assumptions of the somewhat improbable romantic plot, no one can survive the loss of the one he or she unconditionally loves. But the concluding sentences of the novel return us to the political story, to Mosca, who even after the loss of Gina continues to prosper through the unswerving, his uh, unswerving political acumen, and to the prince, who also prospers, surely with Mosca's help. But in a report of success that is not without a hint of irony. And this is the very end of the novel, I quote, the, prince, the prisons in Parma were empty, the count immensely rich, Ernest V adored by his subjects, who likened his government to that of the Grand Dukes of Tuscany. Fiction, as has often been observed, enjoys privileged access to the inner life of its characters, to their motives, their ambitions, and their self-deceptions, deploying all the technical means available to it from interior monologue and narrated monologue, that, that is free and direct style, to analysis and revelatory dialogue, act and gesture. When focused on the world of politics, uh, such fiction can provide illuminating insights into how individual character strives for power and how power affects character. The true novelist, Henry James said, is someone on whom nothing is lost. It seems remarkable that a writer exercising this sort of subtle observation should have emerged in ancient Israel almost three millennia ago at a time when prose narrative was scarcely evident elsewhere. Though it is less surprising that a kindred intelligence should have been active in France in the wake of the Enlightenment. The two writers differ drastically in tone, sensibility, and narrative strategies. Yet they both triumphantly demonstrate that fiction can be a supple instrument for encompassing the contradictions and the ambiguities and the sheer brutality of life in the political realm. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'm going to spare my trilling anecdotes. But. In Jewish tradition, one mark of a great darshan or expositor is the ability to select two texts as remote as possible and then by a series of cute interpretive moves reveal their deep connection. Listening to Bob Alter as he expounds affinities I'd never imagined between the David story and the Charter House of Palmer. I'm, I feel as I would before a striking metaphor what Edmund Wilson, echoing Melville, called the shock of recognition. <laughs> 
In responding, I want to explore a little further the affinity Bob has uncovered, taking as guide the two words of his title, political fiction, but turning them, turning them around, and since the political has already received a generous airing, concentrating on the complementary term, fiction. By political, I take it Bob means what Balzac meant when in his famous review of the Chartres, he suggested that Stendhal had written The Modern Prince, the book Machiavelli would have written had he lived in the 19th century. According to Machiavelli, everyone sees what you seem to be, but not what you are. A wise ruler must therefore know when not to be good. It's a consequentialist view of politics. Good and evil are only means to an end, which is power over others. Moreover, for his prince, as for Stendhal's, the final end of such power is not, say, Aristotle's the human good, but the gratification of personal vanity. As introduced into literary discourse by Madame de Stael, fiction was a substitute for roman, novel in English, a term tied to the tradition of chivalric and sentimental romance, which she wished to demote de 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 in favor of realistic themes, such as vanity, greed, and ambition, in short, political fiction. In the primary meaning, however, fiction, referring to what is made or invented or imagined, stands rather opposed than allied to reality, nonfiction. In this sense, the pleonasm poetic fiction and its complement, politics, real politique, are antithetical. To understand the place of politics in the David story in the Chartreuse, works given to painting by contrast, we need to define for each its opposite pole, namely the fiction, or fictions against which the reality of politics is set. I shall try to do this in two steps, of which the second will subsume the first, so that in the end, the resemblance between the ancient and the modern will be as much structural as thematic. At the most basic level, the tension that drives the David story is reflected in the plot. If we bracket scholarly questions about the history of composition, a topic on which Bob and I have an amicable difference of opinion, the outline of the David story is deceptively simple. Two curves, one rising, one falling, joined in a classic arch or parabola. We have an initial version of this pattern, the career of Saul, whose decline following his anointing intersects with David's rise. What makes the David story so distinctive is that its two movements belong to different domains. During the initial rise, the emphasis is public and political. During the decline that follows, personal and psychological. Joined together, the two halves form a tale of metamorphosis as the Shrewd and ruthless strong man of the, Dave, of the story of David's rise, who can conceal his true thoughts following the death of Saul and deflect suspicion with a magnificent elegy, becomes the suffering, impotent father of the court history, reduced to a pathetic stammer following the death of his own son. There's no time to fill out these two versions of David, but it's no accident that the Machiavellian hero Bob has described so well, the calculating master of disguises, is drawn exclusively from the first part of the story, the account of the rise. The one exception, the mission of Hushai and Zadok, uh, in fact confirms the pattern, uh, as I'll explain when we come to our second level. By contrast, David's career from the Bathsheba episode on is a string of false steps and misjudgments. He neglects duties, bungles intrigues, misreads intentions, mistakes friends and enemies, lets himself be gulled, and in the end precipitates a civil war by gratuitously insulting the northern tribes. Meanwhile, the Machiavellian role has been redistributed among his intimates, the Pandora, Jonadab, Joab, Nathan, Bathsheba, and above all, Absalom, who puts on his father's ruthlessness and cunning, winning the people's favor by public flattery, like young David himself, or in a more grisly instance, using his sister's rape by the half-brother Amnon as a pretext to assassinate the one sibling who stands between him and the succession. The crucial point about this second movement, however, is that David's failures of political judgment are accompanied by the revelation of a new emotional depth and vulnerability, human qualities that seemed lacking in the ambitious upstart and wily courtier. Like his literary progeny, Lear and Gorio and Sutpen, David attains his greatest stature and universality through his loss of power, through weakness, failure, and suffering. 
If there's a lesson to the David story at this elementary level, it is that depth of feeling and political ambition, the lust for power, are incompatible. In the Chartreuse, politics is defined by the spectacle of the court of Parma, itself an allegory of French society during the Restoration. Stendhal's own political views, despite his liberal affiliations, defy categorization. I love the common people and detest their oppressors, he wrote in Henri Poulard. But for me to actually live among the people would be an incessant torture. <laughs> this ambivalence has its counterpart in his greatest novel, which heightens our sense of the political by promoting a view of fulfillment that is indifferent to it. Like the opera buffa he loved with its oscillation between comic recitative and lyric irony, the Chartreuse is defined by its oppositions. France and Italy, reason and passion, vanity and sincerity, engagement and flight, culture and nature, each pair intersecting a slightly different angle with the central axis of the plot, which has ambition as one pole and love or la chasse au bonheur as the other. It's the prince, as Bob said, who gives expression to the Davidic tension in its simplest form when he professes to his minister, I am a man before I am a prince. But his actions belie his words, and the petty vanity that drives his obsession with power makes him at best a caricature of the Machiavellian ruler. By contrast, the three figures who share the leading role are each endowed by their author with an intelligence as subtle as his own. Since there's no time to discuss all three, I'll concentrate on Fabrice, whose choice of solitary imprisonment in the Farnese Tower sets the theater of politics at naught. Fabrice is the paradigmatic hero of the French, if not the British, 19th century novel, alienated from a society that values power and wealth rather than happiness or beauty. A changeling, none of whose various adopted names is truly his own, he's constantly evolving and dissolving with a mobility of a figure in a dream. He's at once Italian and French, aristocratic and plebeian, plebeian, virile and feminine, Prince Charming and Sleeping Beauty. The love for which he waits unawares crystallizes only when he enters the cloister of the prison. But even amid the hypocrisy and corruption of the world, where he's not without some political talent, he remains always detached, managing to retain an essential innocence expressed in his spontaneity no less than his credulity, his faith in omens and his indulgence in prayer, and the ease with which he relinquishes control, sleeping through the Battle of Waterloo, for example, and dozing off in the middle of his dramatic escape from the tower. In politics, every act must be governed by its end. In love, the end must remain elusive. What matters is the pursuit. Once Fabrice succeeds in entering Clelia's hidden garden, Stendhal loses interest. But even in pursuit, it's hard to see Fabrice as having a clear object. Most of his attention is taken up with the means of expression, the manipulation of the physical setting, the devising and deciphering of codes. And Clelia herself is almost a mirage, pale, remote, impassive, ultimately invisible, her beauty at the furthest remove from the radiant, full-blooded animation of her rival. The formless vision of love that dominates the second half of the Chartreuse has its counterpart in the formless vision of war that commands its opening. The significance of these opening chapters goes beyond their comic portrayal of Fabrice. The battlefield at Waterloo, which we witness partly through his eyes, is a kind of primal chaos. Generals and privates equally lost wander or stampede through flooded fields where the wet ground seems to explode. It's a world of flounderings, of thefts, and desertions, smoke and mire in which men and animals are indistinguishable. To Fabrice, the soldiers seem like moutons. Mm -hmm. Mad as it is, such lawlessness is a form of freedom, which is why Fabrice at Waterloo, at Waterloo experiences the same sense of happiness he will feel when he falls in love. In escaping the hierarchical worlds of family and court and ignoring the rules of the political game, whether by running away to war or falling in love, Fabrice succeeds in entering the world of fiction. 
and allowing for the moderation that comes with experience, the same appetite for the boundlessness of fiction distinguishes Gina and Mosca. Mosca relishes the foolish timidity he feels during his early courtship of Gina, as he relishes the foolish bravery he feels risking his life to put down Ferrante's revolution, because they give him the illusion of youthful freedom, while Gina's entire career is an attempt to recapture a paradise lost, to recreate the feverish happiness of her early years in Milan, that legendary time of gaiety and freedom under the lovable Prince Eugene with which the novel begins. What makes for the great irony of the Waterloo chapters is our knowledge that war is not a fiction, unlike the dream of happiness or love, but those chapters are as essential as the opening description of Milan to a novel so engaged with politics, for it is Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo that created the court of Parma. Metaphysically, the theater of politics is the little world suspended between the chaos of war and the boundlessness of love. Psychologically, it stages its worldly spectacles in competition with the twin dreams of memory and hope, of paradise lost and regained. Eliminate the dreams, and one is left with a static emptiness, the hollow triumph of the political. The prisons of Parma were empty, the count enormously rich, Ernest V adored by his subjects. At the end of the novel, Mosca survives alone in a world rife with dissembling but devoid of animating fictions, love, liberty, authenticity. It's not only the prisons that are empty. I wanna move now more briefly to what I shall call the second or higher level. So far we have seen how the David story redefines reality, shifting it away from politics by opposing the public and the private. We have yet to see how it opposes politics and fiction, which in the Chartreuse determine the axis of the plot. The Bible, too, has its antithetical fiction, its structural equivalent of the chasse au bonheur, but it is opposed as much to private feeling as to po political ambition. In place of Stendhal's apolitical paradise, his Milan of dreams, it envisages a legendary time represented in the books that precede Samuel when the newly liberated nation acknowledged God as its king. Theocracy originates and is at home in the wilderness and the wandering that the prophets liken to a honeymoon. Once Israel crosses over and takes possession of its inheritance, the honeymoon ends. For a while, the vision of divine kingship manages to survive under a succession of temporary guardians, but it becomes ever clearer that the alternative to a stable political system is anarchy and collapse. As the narrator comments dryly at the end of the Book of Judges, where intimidation, gang rape, and collective fratricide seem to have become the norms, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Samuel, the book that immediately follows, tries to deal with the implications of this lesson. Where the when the people clamor for a king of their own so they can be like all the nations, Yahweh, bowing to reality, declares himself willing to abdicate and instructs his prophet Samuel to anoint Saul as king. All this takes place before David appears, but it's crucial to his story. The book of Samuel begins with a kind of prelude in which the youthful Samuel displaces the aging priest Eli who has sheltered him like a son. Similarly, in the body of the book, the youthful David displaces his adoptive father, Saul. The difficulty lies in the fact that Saul is the duly anointed king, while David is an obscure upstart whose ascent to the throne at the expense of Saul's descendants could be viewed historically as an act of usurpation or theologically as proof of divine inconstancy, of an irresolute and faithless God whose word cannot be trusted. <laughs> the, latter themes become, the latter theme becomes explicit in the pivotal episode of Saul's rejection, which creates the conditions for David's rise, as God's own rejection by Israel created the conditions for a political world in which usurpation is a constant threat. When Samuel underlines the finality of Saul's rejection, by declaring categorically, the splendor of Israel will not lie or repent, that's to say change his mind, for he's not a man that he should repent. He's ignoring God's own word to the contrary and echoing ironically the Gentile prophet Balaam. The narrator, however, knows better. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel are the last words of the chapter. 
Hebrew nacham, commonly translated repent, connotes more than a change of mind. It hints at an inner conflict, as when in the prelude flood in Genesis, God repents that he created man. Divine repentance takes an even stranger form in the conclusion to the book, where God provokes David into taking a census, an offense against the fiction that's the divine king Yahweh who fights for Israel. And then when he does so, punishes him by unleashing a deadly pestilence. The suggestion of malice is so troubling that a later scribe, recounting the episode in Chronicles, ascribes the initial provocation not to God, but to Satan. But the point of the original, reinforcing the rejection of Saul, is precisely our inability to comprehend or anticipate God's acts. Thus, even as the avenging angel is stretching his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, Yahweh, are told, repented him of the evil and spared the city. As so often in the Hebrew Bible, the author then presents us with a second stumbling block, for in the very last verses, that is, after God has spared the city, we see David building an altar on what will become the site of the temple and entreating God to spare the land. So the Lord was entreated and the plague was stayed. The puzzle, which turns on the sequence, the apparent reversal of cause and effect, transposes the central dilemma to a different key. No longer simply politics versus theology, but to adopt a much later terminology, salvation by works versus salvation by gratuitous or provenient grace. The David we see in the final scene belongs to a register we have not yet discussed. He is neither the Machiavellian strongman nor the love-stricken man of sorrows, but the exemplary servant of God. Throughout the book, the oracles that fall mute for Saul function reliably for David. His successes in the field testify to his skill, but also to the divine guidance he is careful never to neglect. Even the crucial decision to send Hushai and Zadok back to Jerusalem after Absalom has occupied the city, which, by, which many readers take as an example of Davidic cunning, is closely bound to a confession of trust and appeal for divine assistance. O oh Lord, I pray thee, David says, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness, he prays. And it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount where he worshiped God, behold, Hushai the archite. At this second level, our questions about David no longer concern the limits of his political ambitions, but rather the reason for God's special favor. Is it piety or is it his capacity to surprise us, his refusal to be consistent that makes David the man after God's own heart? For Stendhal, a transcendent fiction is obviously not an option. In the celebrated phrase envied by Nietzsche, God's only excuse is he doesn't exist. Though Stendhal sometimes treats love as a religious vocation and Fabry sacrifices sincerely on both altars, the transcendent third term, I'm sorry, the third term in the Chartreuse, which subsumes or raises us above the choice between politics and fiction, is not the voice of God, but the urbane voice of the author. urbane voice of the author, which not only unifies what transposed to another key would be an ill-assorted melange of political anecdote, lyrical effusion, gossip romance, and adolescent thriller, but turns the duel between court and tower, engagement and withdrawal into a dance or diversion. It does so by shifting from amorist to analyst, from sensibility to wit, with an unpredictable improvisatory abandon. Stendhal invents the moods and responses of his characters, their inner dialogue no less than their action, without a fixed plan. Their passions are his passions and they elicit a corresponding complicity in the reader. We feel while reading him that we ourselves living with the hero and creating with the author for whom writing or dictating was an act, an exercise in self-recollection. It's no accident that the Chartreuse begins at the very point where the project of autobiographical confession in Henri Boulard breaks off his arrival in the wake of Napoleon at Milan and the beginning of his love for Angela Petrogrua. Mosca's lucidity, Gina's impulsiveness, Fabrice's alienation and reclusiveness are his own. But writing's also self-display and self-mockery. Authenticity is one of the fictions, and hypocrisy, etymologically the playing of roles, is its faithful shadow. 
As Machiavelli said, one is never what one seems. It's not the author who writes, but a fictional author, a pseudonym, Henri Broulard or Stendhal. Pseudonyms can be a disguise, as they are for Fabrice, but for Stendhal, they seem to be more, to reflect the discomfort with the very notion of discrete identity. For those of you who are not Stendhalians, uh, Henri Bell, the historical Henri Bell, had up to 200 pseudonyms, of which the most famous is, is, is Stendhal. <laughs> Among the desired endowments on his fanciful wish List. Les privilèges is the ability four times a year for the privilégié to change himself into any man he chooses and to occupy for an unlimited time two bodies at once. Valerie once speculated that Stendhal's need to dissemble, his playing of roles and his relentless irony expressed a horror of being merely one among others, his horror d'être semblable. To dissemble was to refuse to be like those around one, to preserve the possibility of future transformations. Like the pseudonym Stendhal, the elusive mobility of the narrator's voice is a defense against definition. To summarize, both the David story and the Chartreuse give salience to a Machiavellian vision of politics by juxtaposing it to something more compelling. Their countervailing fictions of different, are of different orders. A belief on the one hand in divine governance, on the other in the pursuit of happiness. This thematic difference then corresponds to a more abstract distinction between anonymous writing objectively focused on an incorporate and dramatic figure of the unnameable and pseudonymous writing subjectively focused on a dramatic representation of a fictive dissimilarity or dissemblance. The difference is reflected in the endings of the two works, where the Chartres ends with the empty prisons, the Book of Samuel ends with a theological dilemma. Note, however, that David does not die at the end of Samuel, but at the beginning of Kings, where he is reabsorbed into the larger sacred history as attention shifts to the future of the nation. Thus, beyond the contrast between politics and fiction, between the pragmatic demands of the world and the burden of incommensurability lies the further contrast between fiction and history. The ultimate fiction of the Chartreuse is that its author is Stendhal. The ultimate fiction of the Bible is that it is not a fiction. Tough acts to follow. Um, it's a great pleasure to be, always a pleasure to be here at Morning's Head Heights and it brings back memories of the time when I first arrived across the road in 1964, which is when I first met Bob. And it's partly, it's partly in memory of that moment that I, that I, uh, that I wanted to pick up uh, the mention of fielding, because at that point Bob was writing or had just written a book about, about a wonderful book about fielding. And I want, to, I want to use fielding as a way into a kind of tracing out the, the argument and the examples that Bob uh, offered us. And it does pick up uh, where, uh, where Herbert has been, uh, took us with the question of fiction, but it ends up in a rather different place about the question of fiction. Uh, the, um, I'm thinking of, a, of a, a particular chapter in Joseph Andrews, the introduction to book three, which uh, uh, mentions in its title uh, that it is a praise of biography. Now, the joke has already begun, since by biography, feeling means novels. Um, that is, uh, a, a biography in feeling's term is a, is a true story about fictional people and to be contrasted with fantasies about real countries. Those are what he calls history. So what we call what we call novels, he'll call biography. What other people call hi, call history uh, is are uh, just essentially fantasies. He feeling says, for example, by by the idea of certain romances, he he, he says books with titles like <clears throat> the history of England, the history of France, <laughs> of Spain, etc. And then he goes on to say that these historians, there's a problem with these historians in relation to the truth and to uh, human life and all kinds of things. These, these historians get the time and the place right, usually, uh, but they get everything else wrong. So I quote now. Uh, these, quote, historians, <clears throat> they widely differ in the narrative of facts. 
some ascribing victory to one and others to the other party, some representing the same man as a rogue, while others give him a great and honest character. Yet all agree in the scene where the fact is supposed to have happened and where the person who is both a rogue and an honest man lived. Uh, now with us biographers, Fielding continues, the case is different. The facts we deliver may be relied on, though we often mistake the age and country wherein they happened. I just read that again. The facts we deliver may be relied on, though we often mistake the age and country wherein they happened. He goes on to list a whole series of characters from Don Quixote and suggests that while Cervantes may have been wrong to put all these people in Spain, no one can doubt their actual existence. Uh, the most known instance of this kind of error, he says, is where uh, is in uh, it's in uh, Le Sage's Gil Blas, <coughs> the picturesque uh, French novel, where he says, uh, "The inimitable biographer hath made a notorious blunder." Uh, the blunder he's made is is describing a doctor who is famous for draining the blood out of his patient's veins and putting water in instead. <laughs> Presumably, he has other things to do with the blood. Uh, uh, the, the notorious blunder, Fielding tells us, is that Lesage situated this, this man in Spain. Whereas, he says, anyone who is the least versed in physical history knows that Spain was not the country in which this doctor lived. <laughs> he goes on to, Fielding goes on to evoke further examples of biographical narratives capable of such interesting mistakes. The works of Scarron, uh, Marivaux, the Arabian Nights, and he grandly excludes from this category. Not only on the one hand he thinks history is just a fantasy, but he also excludes the people he calls novelists. That is, people, he says, uh, the authors of immense romances or the modern novel. These are people who don't get close enough to the truth even to mistake it. <laughs> okay. They're not even, they're not even in, the, in the same realm. And then he concludes this, uh, this riff by uh, saying that Don Quixote is more worthy of the name of history even than its French successors because whereas even the best of the French uh, novels, Gilles Blas and others, uh, even the best of these, it quote, I quote now, is confined to a particular period of time and to a particular nation, the former, Don Quixote, is the history of the world in general, at least that part which is polished by laws, arts, and sciences, and of that from the time it was first polished to this day, nay, and forwards as long as it shall so remain. Now, there are two arguments here, one quite traditional, the other uh, mischievous, unstable, and deeply radical, I think. Let me just recall the key sentence. The facts we deliver may be relied on, though we often mistake the age and country wherein they happen. The first argument is about univers universality and probability. It's entirely faithful to Aristotle's, uh, th Aristotle's thinking on the distinction be between history and poetry, except that history is saying that poetry is better history than history. <clears throat> the second argument, the radical, uh, unstable argument, centers on Felix's insistent mis mischievous use of the concept of the mistake. He calls everything a mistake. Uh, so in one sense, of course, there is no mistake, and that's what Fielding's saying. There is only what may look like a mistake. Once we relocate the characters in the proper place, the truth is perfectly clear. We just need to shift them from England, from France to England, or from France to Spain, or from Spain to England, and everything will be okay. Uh, no mistake. In, a, in another sense, of course, mistake is really quite the right word, because they are in the wrong country, and they do have to be relocated. And Fielding doesn't actually want us to believe that England, France, and Spain are the same. That's what a fiction is. It's a theory of fiction. It's a mistake, and it's not a mistake. <laughs> And this is why it has, uh, as Bob says so well, a special purchase on politics. This is why fiction has a special purchase on politics. Indeed, it is, I think, uh, in, a, in a broad and interesting sense, I want to say fiction is itself political because it requires us to think about where we are, which country we're in, which time we're in, and where we might be if we weren't there. Uh, Stendhal's phrase about the pistol shot in the middle of the concert that Bob quoted uh, and a, a gloss so well. That clearly, it's a very clear remark. 
what it says is that guns should not be part of the concert unless they're a part of the score, right? <laughs> if, there are no, if there are no guns in the score, the uh, guns in the concert are an interruption. But that's what it says. But of course, the idea of the pistol shot that we've still got to attend to if it actually occurs allows us to distinguish, I think, between loud, obvious, unobtrusive politics, that is, talk of politics, and the subtle meditations on politics that happen on every page of Stendhal. So that the, here is a man decrying politics in a novel, but he, his novel is packed with them. But of course, it's not a contradiction if you think of politics as loud and shouting. And, and, and there is another subtle, more insidious form of politics. So just to continue with this thought a little, when we say we know that Spain was not the country in which the doctor lived, the one who drained the blood out of his patients, uh, when we say we know that Spain was not the country in which he lived, we, of course, we know nothing of the kind. What we mean when we say Spain was not the right country is that we know someone just like him who lives much closer to us. <laughs> or we might mean that our doctor is undoubtedly the real one and that Spanish fellow must be, therefore must be a fraud or a copy. Right? Now, either way, the thought, uh, this is not the right place, underlines the analogical anachronistic element in all reading of fiction, and perhaps, uh, this is a little further out, in all reading, that, 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 that all reading takes place in more than one time, and in one sense, it doesn't work if it isn't in time, and it doesn't really work if it's not also out of time in some way. That all reading then becomes something like the recognition of something we don't know, or the remembering of something we've never, we've never experienced. So it's not then, I just want to continue with this, this particular radical thought, and this is what I'm taking, I'm really just paraphrasing Bob here. It's not that the characters of the David story and the Charter House of Palmer are universal types and can be recognized anywhere. On the contrary, there aren't that many of them. Maybe there are only two sets. Uh, they are an, are, an are an anachronistic reading, when it's, when it's working well, relies on sound chronology. A chronology depends on sound chronology, on a real awareness of distances of time and place, as Bob underlined for us. So if in the book of Samuel, we have what Bob calls the first full in his book on the, uh, the David story, if, if in the book of Samuel, we have what Bob calls the first full length portrait of a Machiavellian prince in literature, it is not because such princes are everywhere, but because they can be found in more than one particular somewhere. And Bob offers, a, offers us a powerfully attractive way of getting from one place to another, uh, a way of cross-referencing refer insights that have very different sources. And as he says, it is among, among the things, uh, among other things, the techniques that are characteristic of fiction that make this cross-referencing possible and illuminating. In this sense, I do believe that, feeling, that Bob goes feeling one better. And he adds another creative mistake to the pile. Not only does Bob offer a reading that mistakes the time and place of two remarkable narratives, he mistakes the historian for a novelist and the novelist for historian. <laughs> that is to say that Bob, in his talk, suspends the epistemological questions about fiction, uh, the questions about in what way is it not true, uh, what is its relation to the facts, and replaces the, these epistemological questions with questions about style and method. I'll recall, if I may, what Bob himself says about this move in relation to, to the David story. <clears throat> uh, Bob says, I would propose that the writer who might conceivably have lived only a few decades after David had before him an account, written or oral, of the principal events of David's reign, but that in order to make compelling sense of them, he felt free to elaborate, elaborate and improvise and to employ techniques such as interior monologues, dialogue where no one besides the two historical personages is present, uh, pointed literary illusion and the thematic shaping of the narrative through recurring motif, motifs and episodes that mirror each other. Now that's a lot of fiction. <laughs> Yet in the magnificent instances Bob has evoked, history only gains from these uses of fiction. History is in no way diminished. It's important though that we can imagine the job done badly. That is, one could, one could imagine the same, the same techniques being used to awful uh, anti-historical effect. But they're not here. This is, this is one of the points about the, the comparison between Stendhal and the, and the author of the Book of Samuel. Uh, and in this context, the epistemological question, the question of how we know things and, it, and what's the relation of fiction to fact actually gets a return. So it would, would in this sense, be using fictional uh, methods, one would be, in a certain sense, be telling lies. Uh, 
But the lies would not be in the making of compelling sense. The lie would arrive when you fail to make such sense. Or the lie would arrive when you made only tilted, programmatic sense. And in this perspective, the very idea of lying and the very idea of fiction changes, I think. And we may now understand an epigram of Stendhal's better than we did before, or perhaps rather differently from the way he did. In a, in a note on uh, his novel, Lucien Leuven wrote, uh, a note addressed to himself, he wrote, lying, bad in reality, worse in, the, in a novel. Uh, he may have meant, uh, the context suggests that he may have meant that it's not good to have characters in novels tell lies, for the same sort of reason that Hitchcock thought you shouldn't have illusions on screen because you just fake it too easily, and, and that lying, lying, you may, you may have meant that lies in novels are a bit like dreams in novels, a little too easy, the technique's too easy. But I, I like very much the, the larger idea. Lying, bad in reality, worse in fiction, could also mean the reader always knows that the novelist is lying. Thank you. Running awfully late, but um, I think if you, there are a couple of questions we can take if people have them. Or not. <laughs> we talked him into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we, we started off with this pistol shot in the concert. And I'm wondering, uh, both of you gentlemen used it, do you have any thoughts about why it shows up in three different works? Because it also is in uh, The Red and Black, and, and it's also, it right, first shows right. up in his 1817, the 1817 uh, travel book, the first one on Naples, Roman, Florence. But, but what is, I mean, this wonderful way of thinking of the, the confusion between history and fiction, mm -hmm. Um, how does that play in? How does that control you? You're talking about anachronisms and, 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 and repetitions. Why, why does he do it three times? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I th one thing, I, will, I, will, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I do think, I, until I read Bob, I hadn't really thought about I thought of it as a more ritual remark. Because, you, Bob, you point out to the end of the phrase yeah. about however gross it, however rude right, it is, right. we've still got to pay attention to, to these things. And I think... I, I guess I'd thought of it more as a kind of ri ritual disclaimer of the kind that writers often do in interviews. You know, who, me? Symbolism? No, no, no. Oh, Did I, I mean see, anything? Yeah. No, I didn't mean anything. I was like, oh, yes, I might have, I'm, you know, I've just written a novel with pistol shots going all over the place, but I can still deny it or whatever, something like that. But I think what you're saying is, is more interesting, that, that actually he's, he's saying something like, um, well, he might be saying something like, uh, it's good to go to the concert, but uh, novels are not concerts. <laughs> is repeating yourself like a pistol shot? It doesn't belong in a novel. <laughs> that, yeah, no, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, look, uh, he lived in... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Stendhal lived in violent times, uh, and uh, he saw frontline duty as, uh, as an 18-year-old. And you know the violence continued, and of course, as a kid, the, the, there was he was very much aware uh, of uh, the reign of terror. And I think uh, I guess I would extend something that, that uh, I, I said briefly. Uh, I think he was a passionate romantic, so he would have liked literature to be the the fulfillment of, of a, a dream of romantic mm -hmm. rapture. I, I don't mean o only romantic mm -hmm. in the erotic sense, mm -hmm. but, but uh, relationship to nature and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, and the fact is that the history he was living in w w was constantly confronting him with something else, with pistol shots. So maybe it's not that surprising that, that he, he repeated it three times. You must have an yeah, explanation. Yes, what do you, what do you yeah. think? No, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 it's a puzzle. I mean, yeah. he was a, a very self-conscious writer, and, and, and maybe some 
people in the audience know better, but I, I can't think of, a, of another passage so, so prominently that he takes and drops in like that. It's not like he was a, a, at a loss for words, you know. I mean, he, he dictates the Chartreuse in 52 days. I mean, he's fluent. Uh, and he takes this funny thing that, I mean, mm. it's out of place. This is, this is to, you, to, to quote oneself like that is, is, mm. is, there's something wrong with it, just as there's something wrong with a pistol shot in a, yeah. in, in a, in a, in a concert. Mm. Um, mm. And I, I mean, my, my think, what I'm saying here is there's a, there's a metacritical problem yeah. Yeah. that surrounds this text that makes it kind of problem, I'm sorry, I should, I should that makes it kind of problematic uh, to use uh, as a starting point. I mean, are, are we, is this uh, history or fiction, what he's doing here? Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, actually, I am afraid we are out of yeah. time. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Help me thank the speaker. <laughs>